I did, read the article and I loved it in the Globe. <clears throat> and you talked about how you help various authors with their books like Lovely Bones. Yes. In what way could you help them make a new ending that wasn't right, theirs wasn't right, or that sort of thing? Um, well, of course, well, I'd have to say Alice Siebold is probably so far my most famous former student. Yeah. And in fact, when I knew her in the 1990s, she was working on the early chapters of The Lovely Bones, so I did not know how she was going to end it, though I knew roughly the destination of the novel. So I can really only claim to have had a hand in <laughs> the early parts. Um, but I suppose I, I teach um, writing in the graduate program at Emerson College, and I teach at a number of writers' conferences. So one way and another, I do get to see a lot of stories and novels at, a, at an early stage, and I, I hope sometimes make useful suggestions and comments about them. I mean, in composition and how they put it together or outline it first or however they go at it? Well, you know, I see things at lots of different stages, but I think I'm always trying to help people to figure out, you know, what's important in the story to them and how they can make what's important publicly yeah. interesting. I mean, I have two um, very overworked sisters in Scotland who are both great readers, and in my writing, I'm always trying to keep them awake at night just a little bit longer. <laughs> um, but I do really value the reader's attention, and I don't want to squander it. And I think that's one of the things I try to impart to the people I, I work with who study with me. Well, it was an amazing book that probably wasn't so. Yeah. Yes, it is. Yeah. that it was uh, my novel Eva Moves the Furniture yeah, because like that. that novel was a huge, huge struggle for me to write and I never thought it would see the light of day and of course it is my most deeply personal novel. It's a love song to my mother who died when I was two and a half. So mm -hmm. I, I remain totally thrilled when I meet people who've read it and whom, strangers whom it's reached. It's, you know, that it's gone out into the world and found its way. And uh, then my other question was, which writers do you enjoy reading yourself? Oh, I'm all over the place as a reader. This book is dedicated to my dear friend Andrea Barrett, who's a wonderful writer, the author of Ship Fever and Voyage of the Narwhal, and most recently The Air We Breathe. Um, I like Charlie Baxter's work a lot, uh, Joan Silver, um, Jim Shepard, um, Amy Bloom. Um, but I have to say that I also spend quite a lot of time looking over my shoulder, reading Elizabeth Bowen and you know great British writers. Um, David Cop I read reread David Copperfield last year, for instance, which was a great treat. And then I also spend a lot of time reading British writers, people like um, Ishiguro McEwen, um, A. L. Kennedy, um, Zadie Smith, to name a, to name a few. So. Um, I'm very, I, I always think of reading as a great, um, as both a democratic activity and an international activity, so I'm happy that I can kind of go all over the place in my reading. Um, but maybe as the library is getting near closing time, I should say um, that I'd be very happy to answer questions privately and give you a, a few minutes to enjoy the refreshments made by the friends of the library. and. <laughs> gather yourselves. Thank you. Oh, yes. well, you don't have, I mean, yeah. the library closes upstairs at 8. Oh. People don't have to get out of this oh, room. Oh, okay. <laughs> you don't have to get out. a little more time. Okay. No, you, you don't have to get out. Yeah, you have to close. I do. Yeah. Are all your um, works based in uh, England and Scotland? Uh, well, in my last novel, Banishing Verona, I managed to bring my characters to America, and I was very thrilled by that. I brought them to Boston and New York for about, I don't know, 80 or 100 pages. <laughs> um, so I'm working up to writing about America, and, you know, I keep, I notice, I, in, for almost a decade, I've said in interviews, the next novel will be set in America, and it hasn't been. So I'm a little wary of absolutely promising that now, but, I, 
you know, I do want to write about America. I think what I don't want to do is to write a satire, which is actually what many British writers have done when they've come to write about America. <laughs> so I'm, I'm sort of interested in writing about America in some more fulsome way, and I haven't quite figured that out yet. Yes. Have you always written? Um, I have not always written, nor have I always wanted to write. I had uh, serial ambitions as a child. I um, read a wonderful book about a nun, and although I didn't know any Catholics, I thought, that's a great profession. I'll grow up to be a nun. <laughs> she went to Africa, and did, it was called The Nun's Story, and she went to Africa and did wonderful things. <laughs> so that, I, I, I worked at that for a few years. I mean, worked is perhaps an exaggeration. And then growing up in the country, there were many animals around, and for a while I wanted to be a vet. And, and then I read a wonderful book about Marie Curie, who discovered radium, and I spent my last two years at high school, I, ha I would have to say in retrospect, tormenting my chemistry teacher in my efforts to discover a new element. <laughs> <laughs> a project to which he was, I would say, less than fully sympathetic. <laughs> Um, so I was really quite slow to discover that the person I wanted to be in a novel was not, um, was not the person between the covers, as it were, but behind the covers. And I think that's partly because even though I was reading books by living writers, uh, they weren't taught at either my high school or at university. We never studied them. They didn't seem to be on the same planet as me. So I, was, I came to writing quite, quite slowly. Yes. How would you suggest a, a new author get his work published? Say, for example, a novel. Um, well, traditionally, there are various routes to publication. Um, one route is competitions, which is one way to get your work read on a sort of level playing field. Um, another route is to find an agent, and um, then that agent knocks on doors with your novel. Um, a third route is to try to publish um, some extracts from the novel, um, some stories, uh, some non-fiction, something that begins to establish your credentials as a writer uh, that makes it more likely that the doors will, uh, will open. But probably the key to publishing anything is, is having publishable work, <laughs> if, that makes, if that makes sense. Um, and, and then once you've got the work, trying to sort of figure out the best way to be an ambassador for it. Yes, one more question. Yes. I'm just curious how long your writing process is and what, what how do you how you how do you write? I mean you said you sort of started with this concept and I mean you work at it every day, uh, you write outlines. Do you have a technique for sort of going at it? I do not have a technique or one technique, and I've written my novels so far in a number of different ways. I wrote a novel called Criminals. I went to the McDowell colony, the artist's colony, with my dear friend Andrea Barrett, and I wrote a draft of that novel in three weeks, and then I revised it for a year. Um, that was very uncharacteristic for me, to work at it that way. Um, most of my other novels I've written over about three years. Um, and I usually have a destination, um, and I think of that destination as like a, I suppose like, I don't know, Mount Monadnock or a Tuscan hill town. I can see it in the distance, but I don't always know how I'm going to get there, and so there's a certain number of uh, U-turns and dead ends and mistakes on the way. Uh, for me, outlining hasn't worked very well so far, but I do keep notes as I write, and I sort of keep a kind of, uh, I suppose you might call it a kind of journal of my work. So I'm saying, okay, well in this chapter, such and such just happened, so what might happen next? You know, so I kind of try to think about it in that way. And um, in the case of Eva Moves the Furniture, I started the novel in 1987, because someone told me a story about my mother and the supernatural. And I thought to myself, that would make a great story. I'll write a short novel about my mother and the supernatural, and it will, and it, and it will be no trouble. I remember myself actually <laughs> thinking that phrase. And I finally finished it in 2000. Mm -hmm. So <laughs> um, after eight 
completely different versions. So, but, so I don't have just, so criminals is at one end of the spectrum, evil rooms of furniture is at another, but I aspire to write most days and I aspire to move, move steadily forward with the novel and then to revise very aggressively. When you have time, if you teach, you know, and everything to write. Well, know? thank you for asking, because many people say, well, you only teach two days a week, or something like that that sounds a little bit dismissive. Um, I try to be quite uh, disciplined with my time, so, you know, perhaps I don't write on the days when I'm teaching, but I write every other day, or perhaps I write in the mornings when I'm teaching, and, you know, then devote the rest of the day to my students. And, and I, I think the truth is, it's amazing how much you can get done in two or three hours if you actually concentrate. <laughs> I mean, I know. I, may, I mean, I know this is no secret, but you know, I, I just I know that I can't waste an awful lot of time, and, and sometimes in a trollop-like way, like the Victorian novelist trollop, I just say, okay, I'm going to write a thousand words every day, and I just sit there. If I finish a thousand words in two hours, I'm out of there. If I finish the thousand words in six hours, I'm out of there. But you know, I'll just stay there for as long as it takes. So I have different techniques for self-discipline. I'm always shifting them. Well, thank you all very much. This has been delightful.